Ah, yes, perfect. In this episode of Auto Car Heroes, a series for which it is well worth subscribing to our channel, we are going to explore a vehicle that defined the performance car for a generation. It came loaded with dynamic technology. In its age, it set new standards for capability and speed, combining the best old school hardware, like a front mounted straight six cylinder engine and manual gearbox, with heavy turbocharging, four wheel drive, and advanced chassis control. Then it appeared on Gran Turismo, and the cult became a legend. It's the Nissan Skyline R34 GTR. So welcome then to the inside of that car. This is not where the Skyline story started. This is not where the GTR story started. But it feels to me, I think because of my age, I think because of international consciousness of Skylines and GTRs and so on and so forth, and also, because of Gran Turismo, it feels like this is the first time that people go, blimey, GTR, in the same way that they might think, blimey, Corvette. It's the one that pops people's consciousness really into absolute mainstream pop culture. And that's despite the fact that very, very few came to the UK, even fewer, certainly per capita, are in the US because it was never certified for US emissions regulation or crash regulation. It was never officially sold there. And even if now you look at their list of cars you can import into the US and ones you cannot as part of that show and demonstrate thing, the R34 is not among them. It is a hard car to get into the States. It still feels like a cult car, even though we kind of all know about it. We all know about it, but we don't see them very often. The Skyline story began in 1957 as a Prince, and there was even a racing version of that too. But it was when Prince Motor Company merged with Nissan in 1966 that the Skyline became a Nissan. By 1969, the Nissan Skyline GTR made its debut at the Tokyo Motor Show. It was a saloon still, but it had a straight six cylinder engine making 160 horsepower. And it raced. The Skyline GTR won 52 races in its first three years of Japanese touring car competition. The global oil crisis of the 1970s made life difficult for its successor, and although in 1981 Nissan used the R30 moniker that would show the way forward for the Skyline, it took until 1989 and the introduction of the R32 GTR to give us an idea of what the Skyline, the GTR, was going to become. The R34 was introduced in 1998. So this car is already a long way down the Skyline slash GTR development path. So what's it like? Well, by today's sports car standards, there are thin pillars, it's a narrow cabin, it's a small car. I don't remember thinking it was a small car at the time I first tested one in the late 90s. To me then, I thought, wow, this is, this is a big substantial sports car, 1600 kilos and really, mega performance. Today that performance is not spectacular. I mean the official quoted horsepower was 280 because that was the Japanese gentleman's agreement at the time. All right lads we won't make any cars with more than 280 horsepower. Their quotes I think rather than mine. I think most of the time when these cars were put on dynos they were making 330 something like that, 340 as standard. But eventually they just went look let's not bother pretending these cars make 280 horsepower because they clearly do not. Performance of the day was absolutely electric. Uh, so the GTR, it has an engine. And what an engine. So a quick bit of history, when the first Skyline badged car came out, it had something like 60 horsepower, but the time the first GTR badged car arrived, it had more like 160. And crucially, it had the six cylinder engine and six cylinders is what GTRs had all the way to the end of this generation car. This is an R34. Now, R32, R33 and R34 cars get what they call an RB26, D-E-T-T, -T, says RB26 on the front. That means they all get two turbochargers, they're 2.6 litres. The turbos work, one of them on cylinders one, two and three, the other one on cylinders four, five and six. By the time the R34 arrived, 
this car was making more like 320, 330 horsepower on most people's dynos, and you can get an awful lot more even than that. Now on standard internals, 400 horsepower is quite reasonable, but you might want to replace the twin turbo with one big turbo, two bigger turbos, or one big twin scroll turbo, which is the current way of doing cool things. There is an alternative racing developed block called the N1 that some people use. You can even increase the stroke by putting a sort of packer on the top. Basically, you can do unbelievably ridiculous things with this engine. Six to 700 horsepower reliably, a thousand horsepower plus, probably quite unreliably. But even in this stock form, in this car, it's wonderfully smooth. It's got a great power delivery and it is really terrific in everyday fast driving. In standard form is where I am interested. It says it revs to eight. What I like about this car is the first 3000 RPM is on quite a small scale and then it opens up because it's expected that's where you'll stay. But actually even from just over three, there's a really broad, even spread of power. We don't have so many three pedal H pattern sports cars as we used to, do we? But what I'm reminded driving this car, even though it's got nearly 40,000 miles on it, is just how well integrated all of those three pedals are. I mean, it's a lovely brake pedal feel. Throttle pedal is long and linear. A bit more notch in the gearbox than I remember, which might be down to this car's age and mileage but it is a nice H pattern, six speed manual. So that's 70 miles an hour, third gear, well 60 miles an hour, third gear at four and a half. And sure, by today's GTR standards, this is not a quick car, but that's 8,000 and 100 miles an hour, just like that. This is still a quick car, an involving car, an engaging car. Let's talk about the cabin of the R34 because in a way it's very straightforward and in a way it's very cool. So first things first, the steering wheel doesn't come in and out, it just goes up and down, but that was par for the course at the time and it is a brilliant, straight, easy driving position with a gear knob that, you know, by today's fancy gear knob standards would, would be disappointing because it looks exactly the same as one I used to have in an, in an ordinary Primera, but it's, but it's cool because it's focused, it's straightforward, the seats are excellent, but the best thing about it is this the first car that I remember that had a truly brilliant, brilliant at the time, now all cars have got a display like this, information display telling me all of the things I might need to know and some things I wouldn't about this car's technological systems. So on my standard display, I get three kinds of modes. On the left, I get boost pressure. On the right, I get oil temperature. You might need to know those sorts of things actually, wouldn't you? And then I can scroll through to another massive screen that tells me everything from exhaust temperature to throttle position to injector pressure. I'm not necessarily sure I need to know that. There is a G mode, lots of cars have that these days. And then you go back to your boost, which is kind of tells you how much boost you've been using over the last few seconds. But the extraordinary thing is that I can then even get into and this is important if you are tuning one of these cars, you can set your own levels of red zones for what happens on this vehicle. So you might wanna go higher on the exhaust temperature before it warns you. You might wanna go higher on the rev line before it shows up the little rev counter. It is, by today's standards, you look at these graphics and you think, hmm, that is not that impressive. But at the time, nothing else had anything like this. And people were talking about at the time, oh, it's the high-tech supercar, you can't crash because there's so much going on. Well, you can crash one, I haven't, but I do know people who have. And actually, by today's standards, it feels beautifully honest. Even back then, it was honest. It was not quite as, it did not take control away from you and hide it behind electronics and power shuffling around and things like that, like sometimes it was implied. This is, predominantly rear drive, which will shuffle power forwards when it needs it. Yes, of course, there are some electronics, but it is fundamentally an honest, engaging, steers brilliantly, rewarding sports car. And if somebody said, look, you can have one of these or a 911 of similar vintage, this has loads going for it. I mean, it's a bigger car and it doesn't have that flat six but it's got a really beautifully smooth straight six. It's got terrific steering, it's got nice handling. It feels modern and yet slightly more compact than today's modern sports cars. And it's quick enough when you want it to be. To me, it feels every inch as special as it did when I was 
two years into my career, feels every inch as special today. What I'm interested in though is to see how well today's GTR stacks up against the R34. And this then is what I think is the best incarnation of today's GTR. It is the R35 and as you get in all of the original cues from the earlier cars are kind of I kind of still here. It still feels like a big car. I mean, the R34 doesn't feel like a big car by today's standards, but it was one of the heavier, more bruising sports cars of the time. And this is true now. The weight is up to nearly two tons. And there are similarities in the fact that the engine is still there. It still has six cylinders. It still has two turbochargers. It still drives through a four wheel drive system that is predominantly rear biased. And it still has that massive capability for tuning and you can just keep an eye on things. It has that sort of real techie involvement. You know, I've got so many dials on here and the R34 was one of the first cars to have that many digital dials that you could scroll through and you could, you could look at. And the same is absolutely true of the R35. If you took all the badges off of them and got out of an R34 and into an R35, could you tell they were related? Yeah, I think this is the modern version of that car, no question. So why do I think this one is the best of the current incarnation? Well, I mean, it's been getting better and better since it was launched, the R35. It's now a, a long way into its life cycle. It's got to be near, certainly nearer the end than the start, but probably actually genuinely near the end. And during that time, its power has been raised, its performance has increased and its capability has increased. And at the moment you can get a standard one or you can get a Nismo one. You can get a track edition, which is kind of in between the two. This is that track edition, but it has also been bought and breathed on by a company called Litchfield in the UK. And I think they probably know more about GTRs than probably anybody outside Nissan. So the shell is seam welded like the Nismo version. There are changes to the suspension, including hollow anti-roll bars and a wider track like the Nismo gets. But this car doesn't get the full Nismo body kit. But then Litchfield takes the engine, which in the normal track edition makes about 570 horsepower, and takes it up to 640 horsepower, which is more even than the Nismo edition. So it's kind of all of the goodness of the Nismo edition, all of the goodness of the standard car. This one gets Litchfield's handling pack too, which is really, really good. I mean, really, really good. This car, I think, rides, steers, grips better, is more rewarding. There's more feel from the steering, there's more feedback. It's, it's just all round a better car. So you get the best of the Nismo bits, you get the best of the standard car bits, you get the best of the track edition bits. And it's also very well priced and comes with a three year warranty. Now, the fact is, I think Nissan used to look at overseas tuners and be slightly fearful of them, especially when it came to what we used to call grey imports. But these days, I think they've kind of realised that places like Litsfield are actually good for business. You know, they drive more sales of this car. And hey, if you're selling a GTR that you otherwise wouldn't sell, who cares if it happens to have somebody else's bits that breathe on it. When launched in 2008, the R35's VR38 DETT engine, a 3.8 litre twin turbocharged V6, made 473 horsepower, or thereabouts, depending on where you live. Since then, it has been modified to make rather a lot more. In 2010, Nissan themselves uprated it to 530 horsepower, and Nissan's tuning arm, Nismo, now extracts 600 horsepower from this very unit. But that's still small fry compared to the output's tuners extract from the V6. Remaps do a job on their own, but bigger turbos under uprated injection systems and lighter forged engine internals bring 800 horsepower within easy reach. We've even driven one with approaching 1400 horsepower as it became the world's fastest drift car. So what's it like? As I said earlier in the R34, you do have that compliant, beefy feel to things that is all still absolutely true here. <laughs> Just turned up to 11T. It's really, really quick. I mean, we've got terrible conditions today, but it's just a sort of car that shrugs off poor surfaces. It kind of shrugs off the rain. The steering's really lovely off straight ahead. Sometimes in a standard GTR, things feel a little bit mechanical and agricultural is the wrong word, but you are aware of things happening. You are aware of the mats you're putting around and you hear the gearbox clonk from place to place and things like that. This, to me, in the way it steers and rides, eases some of that out. It adds a slightly more 
sophisticated feel to what is otherwise just a, a really brutal car and actually is a little bit more reminiscent of the 34 and previous Skylines in that they do have that a little bit more nuance and a little bit more suppleness at the same time. I really, really like this car. For all of these slightly tenuous reasons for getting this car and an R34 together, there is one question I would like answered, which is, does today's GTR, near the end of its life cycle, feel like a fitting continuation of all of that heritage? Or is it just plodding along until we finally get an R36? And I have to say that in this form, in this particular specification, on this day, there is still absolutely loads to love about the R35. It feels, to me, as special as the R34. Yeah, I'd really like a new one. And when it arrives, even by the standards of a car which has been on sale for the best part of a decade, when the new car arrives, it still has a, an awful lot to live up to. If you like this nonsense, don't forget to like, subscribe and even turn on notifications so you never miss another Autocar Heroes video.